Well, if you're one of our kids who's going downstairs to Children's Church, it's time for you to meet Miss Misty and Miss Donna at the back of the room, and they'll take you downstairs. And while they're making their way back, I want to introduce you to a couple of folks. Uh, up on the stage right now, you'll see Dan and Trish Vasek. Uh, they are a married couple who have two kids, and they're up here today. They're going to read for us John 16. And uh, just thought you should get to know them a little bit. And, and Dan is one of the gentlemen who is a part of our prospective elders group. Uh, so without further ado, can you all read John 16? In fact, if you have your Bibles, I'd recommend you open and uh, take a look through John 16. These things I have spoken to you, that you should not be made to stumble. They will put you out of the synagogue. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. And these things they will do to you, because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things I have told you, that when the time comes, you, are, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I did not say to you at the beginning, because I was with you. But now I go away to him who sent me, and none of you who asked me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I will tell you the truth. It is your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send you to I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they do not believe in me. Of righteous, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I say, I said, that he will take of mine and declare it to you. A little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me, because I go to the Father. And some of his disciples said among themselves, what is this that he says to us? A little while, and you will not see me. And again, in a little while, you will see me. And because I go to the Father. They said, therefore, what is this that he says? A little while. We do not know what he is saying. Now Jesus knew that they, were, that they desired to ask him. And he said to them, Are you inquiring among yourselves about what I said? A little while, and you will not see me. And again, in a little while, you will see me. Most assuredly, I say to you that you will reap, you will weep, and lament, but the world will rejoice, and you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because of the hour has come, but as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish, for joy that a human being has been born into the world. Therefore, you now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and your joy no one will take from you. And in that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. These things I have spoken to you in figurative language. But the time is coming when I will no longer think, speak to you in a figurative language. But I will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day you will ask in my name, and I do, do not say to you that I shall pray the Father for you. But the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me, and have believed that I have come forth from God. I come forth from the Father, and have come into the world again. I leave the world, and go to the Father. His disciples said to him, See, now you are speaking plainly, and using no figure of speech. Now we are sure that you will know all things, and have no need that anyone should question you. By this we believe that you came forth from God. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Indeed, the hour is coming, yes, has now come, that you will be scattered, each to his own house, and you will leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you, that in me, that you may have peace in the world, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Well, thanks for reading the word to us today, guys. What I'd like to do is just jump right in here and uh, do a little bit of teaching if that's okay. The 
is that God wants you to be happy, healthy, and prosperous. He wants you to enjoy good health, prosperity, a beautiful house, a good job, a wonderful body, a family that never argues or, or goes through any kind of turmoil. You only laugh together and play together and have fun together. And if you're not experiencing these things, then you're probably not being obedient to God. And there's good news. You can earn your way back to God's grace today. I've got a dish I can pass amongst the church. And if you just drop a few dollars in there, you can earn your way back into God's grace. And you can have all these things I've spoken about. You ever been to those churches? You ever heard those preachers? Yeah, right? Those preachers, like that gospel is out there, which is, is not a gospel at all, but it's definitely out there. I, I bet they're not preaching John 16. <laughs> or, or if they are, I can guarantee you that they're twisting the words of Jesus, as so many have done over all the centuries, to fit their own interpretations, to fit their own needs. By the way, that's utter foolishness. Those of us who preach and teach, we understand that there is a day when we will give account to God for what we did with the gifts and the wisdom and the resources and the calling that He placed upon our lives as shepherds. And we will be judged by a different standard. And so it is a serious call. And then there's another, uh, there's another end of the religious spectrum, if you will. So on one side, we've got God only wants you to be happy. God only wants you to be healthy. God wants you to have a beautiful house. But then on the other end of that spectrum, there are people who believe that they actually have to punish themselves because of their sin. That somehow, in their own efforts, they have to, to, to do penance and, and, and to work their way back to God. In fact, I don't know if this is true, but I remember when I was in college, I had a history teacher who taught on the Civil War. And this particular teacher told us that Abraham Lincoln, based on some of his religious beliefs, um, he, he would actually go into a room in the evening and, and, and he would take a, a whip and he would smack his own back for his failings. For his sin. Again, I, I don't know for sure that that's true, but that story always stuck with me. Whether it's right or wrong, it's always stuck with me because I think, what kind of a people are we that we would embrace a gospel where we think we need to bear the stripes for our sins? When that work was accomplished, Jesus bore our stripes. And when he bore them, he said, it is finished. The work is over. And so there's these, these extremes of faith. What on earth will we believe? Well, praise the Lord that God gives us the Scriptures. That God gives us His Word. That Jesus Himself actually spoke to His disciples. It's interesting when you read... John's Gospel that he actually spends five chapters reporting to us the last conversation Jesus had with his disciples. Chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. It's all a conversation that Jesus had in those final hours before he would be uh, betrayed, arrested, tried, and crucified. And John wants us to know exactly what Jesus had to say to his, his closest friends, his inner circle, his, his disciples in those final hours. And so as we read chapter 16, we, we really want to dive in and pay attention and really say, well, Jesus, what did you say in, in those final moments when it was so important and you wanted to share with your most intimate friends, like, what did you have to say? And, and in this conversation, it's interesting because uh, the way that a lot of us do school today, and I don't know if every teacher does it this way, but at least I did when I was teaching, we, we typically employ a method that's called scaffolding. And in scaffolding, here's essentially what you do. You teach a concept to mastery. 
And, and once the student has reached mastery on that concept, you go to another concept uh, and, and you teach that one to mastery. And then you build on that and you go to another concept and, until the student has arrived at mastery. That's not what's happening here in, in John 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. There, there is not a scaffolding technique. What Jesus is doing is he's using another strategy that we would call spiraling. And so what he's doing is he's saying, here's some stuff I want to tell you, but I also want to tell you about this point, and I also want to tell you about this point. Now let me go back to that first point and, and dig a little deeper. And now let me go back to that second point and kind of press down on that one. And so some of these things you're going to say, well, wait a minute, haven't we talked about these things in previous chapters? And the answer is yes, we have. But if Jesus is repeating them, it's because he wants to make them clear to us. And the reason I said there are some preachers who are not preaching chapter 16 is because listen to what Jesus says. He said, in this conversation that we've been having, in, in these final moments in this conversation, I've told you some really hard things. Some things are hard to understand. Some things are hard to accept. Some things you just don't want to be true. But I'm telling you these things, he said, so that you won't abandon your faith. That's why I'm telling you these things. I'm telling you the hard stuff because I don't want to mislead you and let you believe that this is going to be easy or that everything is sunshine and rainbows and smiles. That's not what this is. And I'm telling you these things so that when the hard times come, you will not abandon your faith. You won't run away. You won't give up. By the way, can I just say how wonderful it is that our Savior is the God-man. That He is, in some amazing way that I can never explain to you, because I don't fully get it myself, I just receive it on faith, that He is fully God. In every possible way, Jesus is God. And yet, in every possible way, Jesus is a human being. A man like you and, and I, a human being like you and I am. And, and, and I find that to be so wonderful because Jesus can communicate to us because he understands, he gets it. But he also understands being God. And so he's like, I want to communicate to you and, and share with you based on how you feel and how you receive and understand things. But I also got to tell you the holy things because I know that part too. And so he said, I'm telling you this stuff because it's hard, man. And, and, and sometimes it's not going to be fun. And I don't want you to run away and abandon your faith. I don't want you to do that. Jesus understands exactly what it means because he understands laughter and he understands joy and he understands fun and he understands friendship. There's no doubt. We don't get a whole lot of uh, explanation in Scripture where Jesus joked or laughed, but no doubt he did. In fact, as you understand the context of, of Jewish culture, you really start to see sometimes Jesus is quite funny. Sometimes he really is quite funny. But it's not just those things. Jesus understands anger. He flipped the tables in the temple, and he said, what are you doing cheating one another? That's not how my people should be treating one another. We don't cheat each other. He understands betrayal. You remember that Judas, who was a part of his circle for almost three years, went and turned him in to the authorities that he might be arrested, and he did it for some silver coins. Jesus understands sadness and loss. You'll remember how Jesus responded when he showed up to find that his dear friend Lazarus had died. When he saw that others around were weeping and mourning over Lazarus' death. And the scripture says that Jesus wept. And I believe that he wept because he understood the sadness and the sorrow of those who were experiencing loss. But he also wept because he too was experiencing sadness and sorrow of a loss. Although he knew what he was going to do. And by the way, there may be people in here today who are walking through that season right now of experiencing loss and sadness. Jesus experienced it too. Jesus experienced abandonment. You'll remember that in his darkest hour, in his hour of need, his, his disciples, they literally fled. And they ran off and they hid. And last week we talked about the one who literally made eye contact with him, looked him dead in the eye, and said, I don't know that man. 
Jesus has experienced all that you and I will ever experience. I don't have it on the screen today, but in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, the author writes this, So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, that is Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold, firm, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy, and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. You know, we, we hear that word testings in other translations, what would render it temptation. And we've talked about this before. Was Jesus truly tempted? Like, did he actually think about and consider and maybe even move toward? No, he didn't. He didn't. But as far as tempting, like, there was the, uh, the, the ask, there was the request, there was the uh, a, a offer you something. In that way, yeah, there was a temptation. And I think when we think of temptation, we always think of the temptation to sin. But brothers and sisters, this testing that we're talking about, it's not just the testing that leads to sin. It's the testing that leads to those things we talked about. Anger, abandonment, sadness, grief, frustration, like all these different things. And Jesus, according to Hebrews 14, he felt them all. And he is now our perfect high priest because he can stand in the gap between you and me and our heavenly father. And he can say, look, I know what it's like. I've been there and I died for them. They're clean. My blood covers them. And the father says, you are accepted, beloved son or daughter. Jesus knows that life is challenging. He knows. He lived it. Jesus knows that the Christian life is difficult. He knows that that the lives of these particular disciples, these who are assembled and gathered together in this upper room as they share their last moments, he knows that their lives are already trying and only going to be more trying in the days and years to come. Let us consider for a moment that in this time, what we see, and shortly after this time, I should say, we see in Rome that there are literally Christians whose bodies are covered in tar and pitch, they are fixed to poles, lifted high, and lit on fire to light the chariot races for the Roman emperors. There are Christians who are literally sewn into the, the carcasses of, of fresh, freshly killed animals, sewn into the carcasses, and then set out into the wild so that wild animals will come and devour the carcasses and eat the Christians alive. It is a time when molten lead is being poured over the heads of Christians. And if you want to get more specific, let us consider the men in that room. History tells us that Peter was crucified upside down by his own request. At least the, the history says upside down by his own request because he said, I'm not worthy to be killed like my, my Savior was. But he ends up being crucified. Thomas is skewered with a spear preaching the gospel in India. Matthew was slain with a sword preaching the gospel in Ethiopia. John, uh, legend has it, was, was boiled in oil, survived that one, and then of course was exiled to the island of Patmos for preaching the gospel. James, the son of Zebedee, was beheaded in Jerusalem for preaching the gospel. James, the son of Alphaeus, was thrown from the pinnacle of the temple and beaten with a club for preaching the gospel. Bartholomew was flayed alive. Andrew was bound to a cross where he preached to his persecutors until he actually died. We know that Stephen was stoned to death. And while he was being stoned to death, looked into heaven, saw the glory of God, and said, forgive these people. They just don't understand. And while some of these were not in the room, we know that John the Baptist was beheaded for paving the way for Jesus. We know that Paul, the great apostle, would also be beheaded for his preaching. And so when Jesus tells these guys, I'm sharing this stuff with you so that when things get difficult, when times are hard, you won't run away and abandon your faith. 
And to the person that we just read about, none of them ran away. None of them abandoned their faith. And I just want to tell you, as a fellow human being, I am not strong enough, and I don't believe you're strong enough either, and I don't believe they're strong enough either, that in the face of that kind of evil and torment and danger, that we would just hold tightly to the gospel, save for the power of the Holy Spirit at work in us. And so Jesus says, I have told you these things so that you won't abandon your faith. Essentially what he's saying is, look, when these things do indeed happen, I want you to actually be affirmed. What I want is for, for your faith to actually be emboldened and, 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 and strengthened. I want you to have stronger faith because I knew these things were coming before they ever happened. And, and because I knew them, you can trust that I am indeed God. I told you they were coming. I predicted them. Stronger because I have to be one with the Father in order to know these things in advance. Stronger because I'm telling you that I will not abandon you. I will not leave you to handle all this on your own. Stronger because I'll send you a helper who will accompany you through the hard stuff. Stronger because you will indeed see that I have the power over sin and death and that even if they should kill you, I will raise the dead. And Jesus tells these, these, these folks, as he's gathered with them, he says, look, you're going to be expelled from the synagogues. Right? You're going to be expelled. You're going to be kicked out. You're going to be dragged out of the synagogues for your teaching. Just so you guys know, I'm in like so much trouble right now. Every time I wipe my nose, my wife makes a, a tick mark. And after service, she just chastises me. <laughs> and so, yes, the Christian life is difficult. <laughs> but the Holy Spirit is with me, and so I'm going to wipe it again. <laughs> Out of tissue writing. I know I tend to do this sometimes. I do sanitize it. You're going to be expelled from the temples for preaching the good news, the truth of Jesus Christ. You're going to be expelled. They're going to kick you out. They're going to drag you out. They're going to stop you from going into the temple. You won't be allowed to teach there. By people who think that when they kill you, they're doing a holy service to God. Now, if I'm a disciple, I'm like, oh, type, excuse me. I heard a little something in that. I might be able to endure the dragged out of the temple part. Did you say when they kill us? that they're going to think they're doing a good thing, really not even too worried about the motivations of their heart, more on the killing us part. Could we talk a little bit more about that? And then just a few sentences later, Jesus doubles down on it, and he says, when these things happen. So that was not an if. It was not a maybe or a perhaps. Like, it's coming. Well, I just read you the, the history. And then Jesus says, okay, in light of all this, okay, in light of everything I've been sharing with you, in light of these things that I'm telling you now, it's better for you that I go away. Say what? Like Jesus, I, I might possibly be able to endure this stuff if you were with me. Like if you were holding my hand and we were together, maybe possibly then I could endure this stuff. But you're saying it's better if you leave? In fact, Jesus said, it is best for you that I go away. If I do go away, I will send him, the Holy Spirit, to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and God's righteousness and coming of judgment. Isn't it amazing to think that none of us has eyes to see that we are sinners destined to go to hell. Like in our own strength, in our own bodies, none of us even has eyes to see it. We don't even know until the Holy Spirit reveals to us that you're a sinner. Everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Nobody escapes the everyone piece. You're all sinners. You fall short of God's glory. And the wages of sin are death. 
And isn't it equally wonderful that the Holy Spirit says, I'm not just telling you the bad news. I'm not just telling you that you're a sinner and you deserve hell. But I want to tell you the good news also, that mercy and forgiveness are available to you. And that they are available to you by placing your entire faith, your complete faith in Jesus Christ as God's one and only Son who died for your sins, rose from the dead, and reigns today. And will reign forever. The Holy Spirit does all of that for us. That's why in John 15, we didn't get to it last week, but in John 15, there's a point at which Jesus says, you didn't choose me. I chose you. And I got to tell you, man, that puts me on my knees and that humbles me to pray daily. I don't understand why. I cannot give an answer why, but I am so grateful. Thank you that you chose me, that I get to be counted as one of yours, that I get to be in the family of God, and I did nothing to deserve any of it. And so all I can say is, Jesus, thank you. Thank you. And I'll tell you what, it gives me a heart that is a little bit more patient and forgiving with lost people. They just don't know better. And they truly don't. And by the way, maybe as a, a launch into our, our sermon series a little bit later this year, they never will unless we tell them. Because most often the Holy Spirit chooses to work through Christians. Come back in May. Jesus goes on and he says, Righteousness is available because I go to the Father. Right? Let, let's think about that for a minute. Righteousness is available because... Jesus is going to die and rise again and go to the Father. That's why you and I can be counted righteous. That's why Jesus said it's best for you if I go away. Because if I don't go away, you'll never be forgiven. If I don't go away, you'll never be made right with the Father. If I don't go away, righteousness will not be available to you. So I have to die and I have to rise. And that's why you get to be saved. Jesus also says here, he says, man, there's so much more that I want to tell you. So much more, you, you just, you can't bear it right now. And we're not exactly sure what he means by this, not 100%. There are a couple of possibilities, and I don't know if I'd be able to cover all of them, but I'll give you a couple. One of the possibilities is, there's so much more I want to tell you guys, but, but right now I know your hearts are broken, because I just told you that I'm going to be leaving you. I just told you that, that, that they're going to kill me. I also told you that bad things are going to happen to you. And I know you guys are trying to process all that and make sense of it. And, and so to tell you more at this point, it, it would just overburden you. And I look at that and I think to myself, praise God that God knows exactly where I'm at in my walk with him today. And he knows what I actually can receive and process and apply and handle. And he's not giving me information through a fire hose. And, and, and he's dealing with me right where I am, right here today. You know, it's funny that uh, a little bit later tonight and then tomorrow, we're going to really honor uh, somebody very special to us, the founding pastor of Grace Hosted Church, Pastor Bob, who, who passed uh, his leadership off to his son, and then his son's kind of an idiot because he passed it off to me. And so here we are, right? But as I think about those things, I'm like, God, God, God was doing things. And so here's my story. My story was essentially this. Janine and I were getting married. We knew we needed a church. We didn't know what that church should be. So we went online and we, we find, found Grace Fellowship. We showed up at Grace. I said, if, if they raise their hands when they sing or if they try to hug me, we will never go back there. <laughs> we walked through the doors. I got three hugs by guys. <laughs> and then we got into the church and we not only saw hands up, we saw some people moving. <laughs> And yet the Holy Spirit did something because we showed up the next week. And before long, they found out that Janine can sing. And so they said, hey, would you guys, I was like the you guys part was cool. Would you guys like to be on the, the worship team? So we started to serve on the worship team. And before long, there were these little assignments and little tasks. And, and John and Bob were throwing things like, hey, would you like to maybe help us at VBS? Hey, would you maybe like to help us with kids ministry? Hey, would you maybe like to help us in this capacity? And so there's a long list of those things. But uh, right before uh, John and his family decided to, to go to Colorado, right before they abandoned and betrayed us, they... <laughs> John called me in and he said, hey, I need to talk to you. And we said, in fact, literally where he's sitting today, we sat in that row. 
We sat in that row, and, and I thought I was in trouble. Something I did with the youth group, and I was like, I don't know what I'm getting yelled at about, but I'm here. I'm ready to, to repent. And he said, hey, this opportunity is open up for me and my family. We, we think we're going to take it. We think we're going to go. Well, that followed a mission trip to Guatemala. There was a group of us in the church. We went down to Guatemala. We did some ministry there. And while we were there, John was asked if he would preach at a church in, I believe it was Guatemala City. But anyway, it was in Guatemala. And, and, and he said, you know, yes. The answer is yes. And then he came to me and he said, hey, would you like this opportunity? Would, would you like to take it? And not knowing what was happening, not knowing what the Lord was doing, I, I said, yeah, that, that would be cool. And so, of course, he helped me and we prepared and we got things ready and, and I was able to preach there. And as I look back on it now, what I see is God was, was feeding me these little bites. He's like, listen, you're not ready for a full meal, but let me give you a bite. L let me give you another bite. Now I think you're ready for a, a small dish. Let me give you a small dish. And then a little bit later, you know what Paul says? That's kind of how it is for us, because at one point in our walk, we are all drinking spiritual milk. We're infants just drinking milk. But God's desire for all of us is that we would mature to a place, by the movement of the Holy Spirit, we would mature to a place where we can eat, eat, eat the meat. We, we, we stop drinking milk and we start eating meat. And I just find it so refreshing that he doesn't shove a steak down our throats when we're infants. He says, I see you. I know where you're at. And I'll give you something that you can handle here. And Jesus said, there's so much more I want to tell you. You just can't bear it yet. And it may be because of what they were feeling emotionally. It may be because they were trying to process the emotion of, of what Jesus was saying. It may also be because he said, I'm going to send the helper. He's not yet here yet. And while there's so much more I want to give you, your brains couldn't process it even if you wanted to. Because until the Holy Spirit comes, you can't understand spiritual things. That may also be the case. I don't know which way Jesus meant it. But I find peace in both of those possibilities. And then in verse 20, Jesus said, look, here's what's going to happen. Right? Because I'm going away for a while, and you won't see me for a while, and then you're going to see me for a while, and the world's going to rejoice, and you're going to mourn, but then you're going to rejoice. And, and so he goes through this whole process, and the disciples are trying to make sense of what he's saying. And in verse 20, Jesus says, look, you will grieve, but your grief will suddenly turn to wonderful joy. It will be like a woman suffering the pains of labor. When her child is born, her anguish gives way to joy because she has brought a new baby into the world. Last night in New Lenox, there was an assessment for baseball players there. And so my sons had to go and be assessed. And uh, just as a, a, a comical piece here, something funny happened. While one of the kids was in the batting cage, uh, he hit a ball and the ball took off and it slapped, slammed into a, uh, a water bottle. And the water bottle exploded. And, and there was like a, a water firework, if you will. It was kind of cool. But then there was this other kid at the other end of the gym and he shouts out, hey! hey! My water broke! <laughs> and of course, my mind was taken to John 16. <laughs> but I, I think of what Jesus is saying. He gives us this illustration that many of us can, can relate to. And even if you haven't been through the process, you can probably imagine or you've heard from others. And, and so I remember when, when Janine and I, uh, when, when we had our three babies, and, and Jesus is right, like the pains of, of childbirth and, and, and labor, it's difficult. I had to wake up extra early. <laughs> I had to pack the car. I had to drive through the traffic and get us to the hospital. I had to sit in that room for hours and hours and hours waiting, thank you. I had to not eat bread. Okay, that's not really what Jesus means. In fact, I forget who it is. It might be Joyce Meyer, but there's somebody who uh, says, man, if you want to understand childbirth, in fact, if you want to right now, you can try this. Just grab your bottom lip and then wrap it around the back of your head. <laughs> Who is it? Cosby. Oh, a Cosby says it too. I'm going to go with Choice Meyer. <laughs> there is something about that analogy. That I, I've witnessed it with my own eyes. That a, a woman, she suffers tremendously during labor and during childbirth. And even with modern medicines and other things that are available, 
uh, there, there's a great deal of pain that I've at least seen with my eyes. And, and then a baby is born into the world. And, and typically what happens then is that baby is, is, is given to the mother at some point. And all the shouting, all the moaning, all of it just kind of goes away. And the mourning turns to joy. And so Jesus gives us this illustration. And I don't know if Jesus meant to compound this or to layer it, but so often I find in his teaching that it's just so deep and so rich that there are other things. And one of the things that I look at in this, and I love it so much, is that I, I have the sense that Jesus is teaching us that sometimes from suffering, sometimes from pain, comes new life. And I think about what we observed a little while ago as we consider that Jesus is body broken and his blood poured out and the pain and the suffering that he endured on the cross that you and I would be born again. That you and I might enjoy new life and life abundant. Amen. Life eternal. And so as Jesus is telling the disciples, hey, you're not going to see me for a while, then you will see me. Uh, again, it, it could mean here that Jesus is saying specifically with his death, like, look, I, I'm going to be arrested, taken away, crucified. I'm going to be laid in the tomb. But that will come back. Like, So you won't see me for a while, but then you will see me. It could be that. He could also be saying here that you're not going to see me for a little while uh, because I, I'm going to ascend into heaven and, and be with my Father. But you will see me again because I'm going to send the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is going to reveal me to you. It could be that. It could also be that Jesus is saying, you're not going to see me for a while because I'm going to ascend into heaven where I'll be at the right hand of the Father preparing a place for you. But brother, I'm coming back again and I'm going to take you home and then you're going to see me and your morning will turn to joy. Amen. And maybe it's all of those. I don't know. But they're all good news. They're all good news. Verse 27, Jesus says something profound. He, he says, the Father loves each of us specifically and individually. And he loves us because we love Jesus and believe that Jesus is God's one and only Son. Remember, we talked about this last week. We talked about how, yes, God loves everybody. There's no doubt. He loves everybody. But to be in an intimate, right relationship with God, that can only happen through Jesus Christ. And so while God loves you, at some point you have to receive that love. You have to claim it, and you claim it through Christ. And Jesus is telling us, the Father loves each and every one of you, and he loves you because you believe in me. He loves you because you trust me, because you know that I'm real. Verse 32, Jesus told his disciples that it's easy to believe these things sitting in the safety and comfort of this upper room. It's easy to believe it here. Like everything I'm telling you, by the way, they said, they're like, oh, now we get it. Now we understand. Now we believe because now you're speaking plainly to us. So now we believe. And Jesus said, do you? Like, do you believe? And essentially what he says is it's really easy to say that when you're sitting in the comfort of this upper room, when we're all together and there's food on the table and it's warm and it's safe. It's easy to believe in here in this situation. But remember, I've been telling you all these things because it's not always going to be easy. I've been telling you these things because there will be dark days. And on those dark days, I don't want you to run away from your faith and abandon it. And so Jesus says something that's, that's really profound in verse 33. I need my glasses for this. In verse 33, Jesus says, Again, I have told you all of this so that you may have peace. But there's not a period. There's not a period. Those who, whose Bibles are open, it says, I have told you all of this that you might have peace. How does that end? In me. In me. Our peace is in Christ. Because my peace is not in the circumstances of a lost job. 
My peace is not in the circumstance of a broken marriage. My peace is not in the circumstance of kids who are doing their own thing. My peace is not in my cancer. My peace is not in, and you can go down that list. No, in all of those things, my peace is where? In Christ. In Christ alone. That's where my peace is. I had a, a, a talk this week with a, a, a wonderful brother. A wonderful brother who said, hey, you know what? I went through some stuff in the last week that really made me ask, do I truly believe everything that I believe? You know, because some of the circumstances of our lives, they force us to really ask, is God in this? And, and do I really believe? And he said, praise God, it just reinforced my faith because I came to the conclusion that I do believe and I have to believe because it's all I got. What an encouragement that testimony is. So Jesus says, hey, look, despite the confusion, the fear, the persecution, the trials that you are about to endure, not only am I leaving, not only am I going to die, you guys are going to run, you're going to hide, you're going to scatter, you're going to reconsider what you believe. You're going to be preaching. They're going to throw you out of the synagogue. They're going to come and they're going to kill you. Like Despite all those things, he said, find your peace in me. I'd like the worship team up at this point. I want to ask the church a question. Have you ever arrived at the destination of darkness and despair? Okay. I just want you to answer privately. You don't have to raise a hand or anything like that. But I want you to answer this question and, and listen to how I've worded it. Have you ever arrived at the destination of darkness and and despair. You ever been there? Anyone ever been there? Okay. You know, for fun, yeah, let's throw our hands up. Why not? I lie. Throw your hands up. Have you ever arrived at that destination? Okay, here's what I want to tell you. That's the lie. That's the lie of the enemy. Because while darkness and despair are real, it is not a destination. It is a valley. It is a season. And yes, we walk through it, but we do not walk through it alone. He walks with us, and he carries us when it's necessary. It is not a destination for our final destination. Our final destination is at home with our Savior and our King. So if I had to summarize this, here's what I would tell you. This is Jesus explaining to the ones he loves, which, by the way, now means you and me, right? We're the branches, he's the vine, we're crafted in. And so that means all of us, not just the men and women who are sitting in that room with Jesus. Jesus is saying to the ones he loves, I get it. Life is hard. It is painful. It is trying. It is difficult. I understand. Believe me, I understand. But take heart. Because for all of its difficulties, I've overcome the world. And your peace is in me. I told you it was coming. I saw it coming. I was not unprepared. I'm sending you a helper. And I will one day bring you home. I'll close with this. I'll draw your attention to verse 26. Tick mark. In verse 26. Jesus says, hey, the time is coming when the helper comes, and I will send it back to them. The time is coming when you will ask in my name. And, and I love that he said, I'm not, at, I'm not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. See, everything up to this point when the disciples needed something, they asked Jesus. Hey, Jesus, will you? Hey, Jesus, could you? Hey, Jesus, would you? They're asking Jesus. And Jesus said, but the time is coming when I'm going home to the Father, and I'll send you the helper, and you'll no longer have to ask me to do it, because you can go directly to the Father. You have direct access to him, and you can ask things in my name, and you will receive those things. You can ask in my name because there is power in my name. Jesus no longer serves as the intermediary between us and our Father. We have direct access to the Father. That veil has been torn, and we can come directly into the presence of our Heavenly Father. And we can speak to him, and he listens. 
and he welcomes us, and he wants us. He says, crawl up on my lap. In all of our trials, in all of our dark nights, in all of our valleys, we can speak Jesus. You know, and there are some times when we don't know what else to ask. We don't know what else to say. There are some times when our grief is just so deep and so profound, we don't even know how to really pray. We don't know what to ask. Praise God that the scriptures tell us the Holy Spirit actually speaks to God for us. The Holy Spirit knows what we're going through, dealing with, and the Holy Spirit says, hey, let, let, let me talk to the Father for you. Let me tell him what you actually need. But in those times, maybe the best thing we can do is just cry out, Jesus! I don't know what else to say. I don't know what I want. I don't know what I need. I know what I feel. Maybe I don't even always know that. I don't like it. Life is hard. It's trying. There's challenges. There's sadness. I'm in a valley. Jesus! Just to reiterate that I'll leave. Because whatever it is that you're walking through, and maybe it's today, or maybe it's coming, or maybe it's a season that you've gone through recently, Jesus saw it coming. He was not taken by surprise. Jesus experienced it too. And so he understands. He's given us the Holy Spirit to shepherd us through those valleys. He's overcome the world. And we will be with him in a little while. So sometimes we just simply speak Jesus.